Funeral service could be over and you could say, I sure miss such and such. It happens that fast. People seem to be in good health and before you know it, uh, they're not here any longer. And if, if that's all we had to look forward to is the living old or having good health here, we'd be miserable, wouldn't we? Boy, life is just way too, uh, too short to think this is all there is. That Christ came and died and bled for sinners, died in our place. We could have hope of heaven beyond the grave. This morning with the Gospel of Mark, as we have been for several weeks here, Mark chapter 11, verse, 20, uh, verse uh, 12 through 21 this morning, a 40, 40th part in our series today, and we're looking at a barren nation. So we're going to see Christ uh, curse a fig tree, and then he's going to curse a nation in that order, and one symbolizes the cursing of the other. So if, you're here, if you were here last week, and you do recall this, that Jesus was uh, in Jerusalem, triumphantly on a donkey, a borrowed donkey. And then as he's entering the city of Jerusalem, just as he's going down the slopes of the hillside there from Gethsemane and into the eastern uh, gate coming into Jerusalem, he begins to weep for a nation. He weeps for those who would never come to trust him as Savior. He's crying because, not because of his crucifixion, but because of their unbelief in it. Today, and then of course last week, if you might recall, he enters the city it's late, he looks around, and he goes back home, and that today picks up the story from that point forward. So now, Mark 11, verse 12, the text reads as follows. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves for it was not the season of figs. And he said to it, that's the fig tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. Now on the following day refers to the day after the events we just read last week, which was the triumphal entry. This is the morning after Christ came into Jerusalem with the shouts of Hosanna and laying palm branches at his feet. This was the morning after that Christ comes into Jerusalem. Uh, next week is actually Palm Sunday. Christians all over the world begin to celebrate the, the final week of Christ's ministry, which is about a third of the gospel message. Uh, the, the final week of Christ's ministry begins on Sunday. The triumphal entry goes all the way through the crucifixion Friday, and of course, we end up eventually going to Sunday's resurrection. But it's called Passion Week. And so I'm going to put on the screen here right now the events of Passion Week. And so if you've never seen this laid out like this, this is why it's called Passion Week. This is why it's laid out such as it is. So Sunday is the Sunday of celebration. It's where Christ comes into Jerusalem with the shouts of Hosanna, riding the borrowed donkey, laying the palm branches at his feet, shouting Hosanna, this is the Messiah, son of David. The next day, which is the day we're looking at in the sermon this morning, is called the day of confrontation. So day of celebration and day of next day, Monday, day of confrontation, where he curses the fig tree and he runs the money changers out of the temple area. And then Tuesday of Passion Week is called the Day of Controversy. It's where Christ teaches the temple and the critics come by and ask him trick questions and try to, try to trip him up and his message is who he was, the Messiah. Day of Controversy. And then Wednesday, many folks consider Wednesday the Passion Week, the Silent Week. Not much happens on Wednesday in the scriptures. But it's called the Day of Conspiracy because that's when the Pharisees come to Judas and conspire with him how he could turn over Christ to them away from the crowds at night. That's the Day of Conspiracy. And then Thursday is considered the day of consecration. Jesus was a Galilean Jew. He came from the northern area, and Galilean Jews were allowed to worship and serve uh, Lord's Supper, or observe Passover the day before Passover in the southern area. So Jesus was, would institute the Lord's Supper at the Passover. That's the day of consecration. And then Friday is considered the day of consummation. That's when Christ is arrested, he's tried, convicted, sentenced and crucified, all on Friday, the day of consummation. His final act during his earthly ministry was the day of consummation, that Friday, Good Friday. By the way, I forgot to mention this. If you are interested, a First Baptist Church will have a Good Friday service on Good Friday at noon. Everyone's invited to attend. It's, about, it's noon to one on Good Friday, so I just thought of that. So if you want to attend a Good Friday service, First Baptist Madison will have singing and, and preaching in the Good Friday message on Good Friday, noon to one. So... If I don't announce it now, I won't think of it another time probably. So let's now look at this. I said last time you guys were here, the week before that, that Christ's final act of healing, his final healing ministry, a miracle took place with Bartimaeus. 
His last miraculous act of healing occurred outside of Jerusalem in Jericho when he heals a blind man. But that's not his final miracle. His final miracle was cursing of the, of the fig tree, which he just saw. Twice in the Gospels, Christ does two miracles which cause harm. Most healing, most miracles cause healing, whether it's healing a leper or a blind person or someone who's lame, or someone who uh, can't speak or someone who can't hear. Christ does all kinds of healing miracles, but he only does, as far as we know, two miracles that cause harm. The first miracle that caused harm, and you guys might recall this, was when he cast the demons and the pigs and they ran down the shore and into the Sea of Galilee and drowned. That's a harm, a, 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 a miracle of harm, right? It caught, killed all those pigs. It caused harm. And today is another miracle of harm. He doesn't harm pigs this time. He harms a fig tree. He causes the fig tree to die. Well, the question we ask ourselves at this point of the story, before we get to the next few verses, is this. Why does Jesus curse the fig tree? Is it merely some sort of impulsive act? You know, they've coined a term in the last few years. It's called hangry. You ever heard of that phrase, hangry? I've known him my whole life because my father said this all his whole life. He gets angry when he gets hungry. He becomes a Hulk when he gets a, gets a little hungry. And we do at times our blood sugar drops. We get a little, get a little angry. It's called hangry. You get, uh, you get angry when you get hungry. Hangry. You see those sneaker commercials? It's been out now for several years. Betty White started a couple of those. And it said this, you're not you when you're hungry. It shows uh, somebody have a temper tantrum, they get upset, and they get a Snickers bar, and then they calm down. So on the outside looking at this, you might say, this is a great chance for a Snickers commercial, right? Or in this case, a fig commercial. Jesus, you're not you when you're hungry. Except that's not why he's angry. He's not mad because he's looking for breakfast and breakfast is not available on the fig tree. There's another reason he gets angry. It's not because the fig tree is barren necessarily. It's because the nation is barren. He uses the fig tree as an object lesson as he would anything else in life, whether it's fishermen by the sea or someone who's lost a coin in a house. He uses object lessons to teach a deeper, a more powerful truth. And the fig tree is a stand-in for as an object lesson for his anger for the nation of Israel. I'll put the text back on the screen. It says this, And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing on it but leaves, for it's not the season for figs. Now, if you're interested in where, G where Jerusalem fits on the map on the globe, it sits, and I'll put this on the screen, it's a kind of visual here, it sits almost exactly in the same latitude spot as El Paso, Texas, which Mike has family there, he said this morning, El Paso, Texas, and Dothan, Alabama. Have you ever travel to Florida and you pass through Dothan, Alabama? You go that far south, you know exactly where it is. Jerusalem sits in the same latitude as that, as, you know, in reference to the equator on the earth. It's pretty far south. And if you've, if you've ever gone far south in the early spring or late fall, you know their seasons are longer than ours as far as growing seasons go. They, have, they already have uh, certain fruit trees starting to bud out, right, in, in the south. That far south, it be, spring comes a little faster. The winter begins to thaw a little faster. And then on the other end of things, uh, summer stretches much later. Uh, the cold winds of autumn begin to come a bit later. The further south that you go, you'd expect that, right? So Jerusalem, they say, uh, that many of their fig trees can produce figs six out of the 12 months of the year. So from April to September, you can find some kind of a fig on a fig tree in Israel just because it's Jerusalem, because it's so close to the equator, because it is much closer further south than, you know, say, Galilee of the north would be. So Jesus is walking along. It's breakfast time. It's morning time. He's going uh, from Bethany where he slept the night before at his friend's house, uh, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. He's going from their house, walking into the city of Jerusalem, and he sees uh, along the way these fig trees which, which now have leaves. They've gone from blooms to leaves. If you guys notice here, we're now getting into spring here, that a couple of weeks ago some trees had blooms and now they have leaves. Some of those blooms have already blown off. Uh, we were going to school, uh, taking camera to school Friday or Thursday, I forgot. And the wind was blowing and these white uh, petals from these blooms came off our tree. And Cameron looked at me and said, yeah, it's snowing. He said, snowing. It was like 60 degrees that morning. I said, no, it's just the blooms from our tree that's blowing into the yard here. So what happens? Early in the spring, blooms come out. And then after that, then becomes the leaf. 
And if it's a fruit bearing tree, by the time the leaves come out, you begin to see the buds of the fruit to come after that, pretty soon after that. So for many, many of the blooms become buds, which makes the fruit. Well, in Jerusalem, you can find figs on their trees as early as late April and as late as late September. Now, early April figs are very hard and very bitter. They're kind of tart, but you can eat them. You can survive on them. But the later figs in season, that's what Mark's referring to, fig season comes late in the year, and the figs are plumper and they're riper, they're juicier, they're more desirable to eat. So coming to this fig tree, Jesus sees a tree which is full of leaves. The bloom is gone, the leaves are here, and you'd expect to find, normally speaking, the plant covered in figs, early figs. But as he approaches the tree, he's surprised to discover there's no figs. Oh, it's not been picked clean by other folks that have passed by this morning. It has no figs on it. It has the process of growth. It's demonstrated that it's leafed out. It's already bloomed and that's already gone. But there is no, there are no figs on the tree. Listen carefully. I'll put this on the screen. Jesus curses the tree, not simply because it was barren. He did so because it typified a barren nation. The nation of Israel still had a temple and a priestly class. A functioning temple with priests offering animal sacrifices. In fact, this was becoming, becoming Passover season for the Jews. Their big holiday of Passover is coming up with the Day of Atonement and the sacrificing of the animals. Had all the functions of old covenant priesthood, all the duties of the priests were still in place, but you know what they didn't have? They did not have the fruit of repentance. They had rejected their Messiah. They determined he was not to be their savior. And so Christ, when weeping over the nation last week, or actually the text the day before, sees a nation that's barren. And so when he comes to town, he gets closer to town, what's he find but a barren fig tree? So he curses the tree, which should have had fruit, but was barren. I want to take your mind back to the Old Testament here. Before the Jews entered the promised land, Moses stopped them short of the entrance of the promised land, and he huddled the group together and he said, God has told me this word. Now put this on the screen here. Deuteronomy 8, 28, 15, and then 25 through 26, and then verse 52. I've condensed what Moses said, but listen to what Moses says to the nation of Israel just before the conquest of Palestine and all of Israel. He said this, God speaking, but if you will obey the voice of the Lord, your God, or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. And if you don't obey the voice, God will curse you. Verse 25, the Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You shall go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them. You shall be a whore to all the kingdoms of the earth, and your dead body shall be food for the birds of the air, for the beasts of the earth. There shall be no one to frighten them away, verse 52. They shall besiege you in your towns until your high and fortified walls in which you trusted come down throughout all your land. And they shall besiege you in all your towns throughout your, all your land, which the Lord your God has given you. Moses, 1,500 years before the birth of Christ, made a prediction that if the Jewish people would not accept the Messiah, would not follow his laws and commands and be faithful to serve him, this would come upon them, that their streets would be littered with their dead bodies, that the walls would be knocked down to the cities, that enemy armies would come in and conquer them. That's what Jesus said last week in the Gospel of Luke we read. He weeps for a nation. And he says to the nation prophetically that there would come a time when the enemies would besiege them and conquer them and knock them down. He basically said what Moses said 1,500 years earlier. And now listen to this very carefully. Jesus found a nation. He found a nation void of spiritual fruit. It was now up to him to prune the tree. It was now up to him to prune the tree. He will strip the, th the authority from the priests on Good Friday by dying in the place of the animal to be sacrificed. He'll make their sacrifices powerless, their priesthood meaningless. He'll make the whole nation uh, null and void in the eyes of God because they rejected their Messiah. Look in verse 15. And they came to Jerusalem. And here's, the, st here's the, the gist of the story. And they came to Jerusalem, and they entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables, the money changers, and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. 
And he was teaching them and saying to them, is it not written? My house should be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you've made it a den of robbers. Well, I'd love to have been a fly on the wall that day, to have heard part of this sermon, to see Christ, who is gentle, meek, and kind, overturn the tables of the money changers and run out the, animal, the animals from the temple area. And then as, he, as the folks run out, to then to give this scathing sermon to the crowd gathered around. Is it not written, he said, my house be called a house of prayer for the nations, but you made it to a den of thieves and robbers. Now, most of us who think of Jesus, who think of him as this kind of a hippie with long hair and long beard and sandals, a tie-dye shirt and hemp jewelry and leather sandals, walking around saying peace and love, right? And certainly he was loving and merciful and kind. He, was, uh, he drew folks to himself because of his mercy. But do not mistake meekness for weakness, he boiled in rage and anger. His anger was not just toward uh, the barren fruit tree, but now toward a barren nation, a barren priesthood, a barren temple which the Spirit of God had now left. The Bible says that he ran the money changers out of the temple. He upset their religious apple cart, ran the, the animal keepers out of the temple area. Now, there's two types of people that he runs out, money changers and animal keepers, right? Now, neither should have been in the temple area. as a place of worship. It was a, a, a big courtyard area where the Gentiles would gather, about five football fields long and wide, a big area for the Gentiles to gather. Money changers are there because, uh, let's, let's, say, let's just run this through hypothetically how this would work. If you traveled, say, from um, Nazareth, in the north, down to the south, and you came to worship uh, the Passover, and you wanted to have an animal sacrifice on behalf of your family to atone for your family's sins, you'd bring the animal, right? But most of the time, you didn't bring the animal because it was a long trip to make. So you said to yourself, I'll just buy one when I get there. They've got plenty of animals for sale that the, 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 the tribe of Levi have been raising all this time for this particular holiday. So I'll just buy one when I get there. But when you get there, you say, I'd like to buy one of your lambs for sacrifice. And the guy would say, sure, it's going to be so many, so many shekels. And, and he said, well, I don't have shekels. I just have Roman drachma. I just have Roman coins. He said, well, your money's no good in the temple. we got to convert that to, to, Jewish, to Jewish coins, right? And so he would exchange your money at a very exorbitant rate, making profit off of selling you coins used nowhere but in the temple area, right? And, and then you've lost money in the deal because you now have exchanged your good Roman coins good over the whole Roman Empire for just these coins good only for the temple area. Now you've, been, you've already taken a big hit financially just changing your money here. And now you go to buy the, the lamb, and guess what? The price of the lamb is now quadrupled over in a bought off-season. So they, they really tricked you twice, once in exchanging your money, and they're taking that money to be sold, uh, to be used to purchase the animal. Oh, it was a big racket. It was quite a lucrative business that the priests found themselves in. Taking advantage of people twice, once in exchanging their coins and then once in selling them animal sacrifices. And who's most affected by this? The Gentiles who had this area was supposed to be the worship for, for the God of the covenant. Gentile converts were supposed to come here to worship and now they're stepping in animal dung and, and moving around tables or money changers are set up. They've taken the worship area for the Gentile converts away from them for the purpose of making money. First century historian Josephus tells us that in 66 AD, that during that week of Passover, that the priests sacrificed about 250,000 animals. Now think about that. Now, if you bought a sheep or a lamb or a goat or something in off-season, you wouldn't pay much, but to have it now priced up five or six times what its value was, they're making a lot of money in this business. Large profits for these men who are not prophets. Listen carefully. Jesus upset the religious apple cart. He halted their trafficking opera operation. He ran out of the temple courtyard all of those who stood between men and God. When the Gentiles gathered, we just want to worship God and, and be close to the temple to hear what's going on. But they couldn't because of the, the bleeding of the animals and the cooing of the pigeons and all the, the traffic of, the, of a marketplace set up there in the very temple area. They were standing between God and men in their practices. So Jesus does what he found best to do. He becomes a one-man army, overturning tables, knocking over, uh, opening sheep. Uh, gates and letting the sheep run out and open the, the, the cages where the pigeons fly out. 
And if all of this chaos, he overturns the tables and the coins fall to the ground, these little clay jars break on the ground, the coins spill out, and the men that are doing this run away from Jesus. And as soon as the, the chaos settles down, the last little pigeon feather floats to the ground, right? And the last little animal goes off in the distance. And he finally has all their attention. He says, and I put this back on the screen, is it not written? My house should be called a house of prayer for all the nations, Gentiles here included. But you have made this a den of robbers. Now when he quotes these verses, he stresses the personal pronoun, my. My house should be called a house for everyone, all the nations. Christ knows the temple area is coming to an end. His house, his temple would soon be torn down. He was to be the final sacrifice for sins. But these priests were standing in the way of, of true worship of him, of God. Look in verse 18. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it, were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him. <clears throat> Because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. So when Christ says this, you can imagine they must have huddled together and said, he must die. We've let this five foot four rabbi do this long enough. No more. He will not live till next Passover. In their secret meeting place, they conspired. This madness has gone on long enough. Jesus goes back to Bethany. It's the day now comes to an end. In the cloak of darkness, these men, these scribes and Pharisees and priests and members of the Sanhedrin say, he's got to die. Little do they know. Unknown to them, in fact, that they're playing a part in the redemption of men. To put Christ on the cross is to carry out the greatest good ever accomplished. You know, that's why it's called Good Friday, not because an innocent man dies, but because an innocent man dies on behalf of sinners. And they conspire to put him there. Look in verse 20. This is the next morning. And they passed by in the morning, and they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you curse has withered. Guys, the fig tree shriveled up overnight from root to top. Now, plants don't die that fast, normally speaking, right? You, you can chop a, a, a branch off a tree and it still has green leaves for a couple of days unless it's really, really dry. This tree is shriveled, supernaturally shriveled, from roots to top, completely shriveled over. That was alive the day before, that is dead now. I was thinking this week as I read this story of the, of the shriveled up tree, how I've seen this story before, but it was an Old Testament story, and it took place in the, in the life of a guy named Jonah, who was a prophet in the Old Covenant. Remember the story of Jonah, how Jonah says, God says to Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh, to the Assyrians, and preach a, a message of repentance to turn away from their sins and to trust me as, as, their, as their only God and Savior. What's Jonah do? Instead of going to Nineveh, back in the east, he buys a ticket for a boat to head to Tarsus, which is Spain, as far west as you can go in the known world, to get as far away from the call of God as he could. Of course, when he's on the boat, um, God sends a mighty storm, and it up, causes upheaval in the sea, and the men in the sea say, someone in this boat has deceived God. He's sent upon us this supernatural storm on the sea, and Jonah admits, it was me. Throw me overboard and spare your lives. They throw Jonah overboard. And God, the Bible says, had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. For three days, Jonah was in this fish. Can you imagine being in a fish that long? I saw the news not long ago. There was a scuba diver who was actually snorkeling, or, or scuba diving, rather, in one of the coral reefs somewhere, and a giant blue whale swallowed him whole. He said he was swimming and admiring all of it because the, 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 the whale came in to find krill or something to eat, right? And he just got swallowed up whole by this big fit, this big whale. And he said, one moment he's swimming, next moment he's in total darkness. One moment he's in, in, enjoying the nice tropical fish or whatever it is, and the coral reefs, the next moment he's in total darkness. Has no idea what's happened. He's swallowed by darkness. And then he feels around and realizes he's been swallowed by something. And of course, a few minutes later, this big whale spits him out. 
And these fishermen happen to be going by miles out in the ocean and see what the, what the middle is taking way out there. And he spots this guy swimming and saw the whole thing happen. Imagine being Jonah, right? Moment, one moment you're in a boat and a storm comes up. Next minute you're thrown into the sea. The next minute you're in, in a whale's belly, right? A fish's belly. Most of us would tell that story to our kids in Sunday school. We stop there, don't we? But the story of Jonah goes further because Jonah gets burped and by the whale and put in the beach and he says, you know what? I've had a change of plans. I think I ought to go to Nineveh now. So he changes the course of plans. He then gets to Nineveh. And you know what happens? It takes three days to walk across that city. And as, as he walks in the streets of that city, he tells everyone, repent, repent. The God of the covenant is going to rain down upon you a fire and brimstone. If you don't repent, if you don't come, come to repentance, God's going to judge you. You know what happens in Nineveh? They repent. They come to accept Jonah at his word. They, they repent of their sins. They turn toward God. And, and Jonah is so upset because they repented. Imagine, he's so upset because they turned to Christ that he goes to, a vill to the hillside outside of Nineveh to look down upon the city. And he's out there having a temper tantrum. And then God causes a plant to grow up during the day to shade Jonah in the big leaves. And Jonah's like, thank you, God, for this plant. I appreciate the plant. And then you know what God does next to Jonah? He then makes the plant shrivel and die. And Jonah gets mad because God's taken a, a plant away. And God says, you cared more about the plant than these people, Jonah. Now, fast forward to the New Testament. There's another prophet who, unlike Jonah, was faithful to the call of God. But you know, in life, just like in the life of Jonah, he shrivels a plant, doesn't he? Like the life of Jonah, he finds himself three days and three nights in the heart of the earth as he, as he prophesied. Listen carefully as we close out this morning. This same Jesus who was a friend of sinners, burned with anger toward those who stood between God and men. This same Jesus would himself stand between God and men when he hung on the cross. So many churches around have pastors in the pulpit that stand between God and men in a bad way to conceal the word of God, to talk about themselves for half an hour, to tell fanciful stories that aren't related to anything about Christ. Shame on those men, no different than the, uh, the Latin mass of the Roman Catholic of the Middle Ages who give, uh, the, give the mass in Latin to blind the ears and hearts of those who heard it. Jesus would stand between men and God and sacrifice. Let us pray.